Hello, welcome to our digital dialogues on transforming the agricultural value chain. Agricultural sustainability is something that we hear all the time, but how is it actually happening and is it happening fast enough? To discuss these issues, we've got a very interesting lineup of um, panelists today. We've got Jens Hartmann at Bayer, Diana Lenzi at the European Council of Young Farmers, John Crawford, University of Glasgow, and Christine Crosby at the Hero Group. Welcome. Um, first of all, I'd like to um, invite Jens to um, make some opening remarks. Jens, the floor is yours. Thank you so much, uh, Emiko. And it has been one of those moments we have a digital dialogue and 15 minutes before the session, the technology lets you down completely. So I'm just very, very glad to have the chance to, to, to join via my, my iPad now and, and share a few thoughts. It's an absolute pleasure to, to be here today, to be here with the, with the panel to really talk about one of the, the greatest challenges which, face, which we are facing in the world at the moment. And that's really the question on um, how do we grow more food on less land far, far more sustainably than it has ever been done before. And I think um, just looking at the recent tragedy happening in the Ukraine, it once again highlights that absolute need that we need to elevate the issue of food production and that we all need to act right now, right here. So um, to just put some thoughts in, I, I thought of talking about a few building blocks and then a few key criteria we, we should look at to really address that topic um, even further. Now, from the building blocks point of view, really three. The first one, um, probably the one one has been talking about um, for, for many, many years already in the past is really the speed, quality of innovation. It's amazing to see how many organizations across the entire value chain um, are in innovating in the, in the space of, of, of food and ag. It's um, amazing to see in terms of depths and breadths what's ha happening on the innovation space. But um, the question is really, what is that impact all about um, of innovation? So that's one part we're going to be talking about later. Second building block, of course, um, very, very importantly, um, the quality of partnerships. Food, as we know, is it's big. Food is complex. Um, when the system breaks, as I mentioned just now, um, we basically have a disaster on hand, disaster looms. So um, there is eagerness across the whole food system to work together even more. And um, I think this event alone, having having all of you in the in the panel, is a is a very very clear proof point for that. Um, then the the last building block and really the most important one um, altogether is is our farmers. It's ultimately about them. Um, we can't fix anything we are talking about, we are striving to achieve without them. They are by far the most important single stakeholder which we have. And um, I'm very, very delighted, Diana, that you are actually joining us today to represent exactly exactly um, those, those farmers. I trust them personally, implicitly. I worked in, in various geographies across the world, must have met probably thousands of them, and they're all somehow one way or the other share the same traits. They are all up for a decent living. They're very, very proud and humble at the same time to deliver the food that the people need. And they want to protect their land. They're in for, for the long haul, so to say, that provides them their livelihood and will also provide the livelihood for, for generations to come. And if others help them to produce more with less, they do their part. I'm absolutely convinced about that. So, so the three building blocks I was talking about before, um, as I said, we are not really there where we want to be. At the current innovation rate, at the current innovation uptake, at the current collaboration depth, the speed of policy making, um, we are not gonna achieve what we want to be able to achieve in terms of our, our food production and to at the same time um, reduce the climate impact to the extent which is required. So the question is really, what is it then? No? What is holding us back? What is the, the or what are the key stumbling blocks to, to get to, to um, where we want to be? And I see there, again, three overriding factors, somewhat one way or the other, very, very truly um, interconnected. Um, I talked about speed of innovation. I talked about speed of, of scaling um, technologies. 
um, one piece. Second, I talked about partnerships, <clears throat> where it's really about how can we turbocharge them? How can we formalize them? How can we set even firmer targets, joint targets um, going forward to work together day in, day out to, to increase that, that pace of change? And then the third very, very important part is this conducive environment we are in um, for innovation, for the uptake of innovation, for collaboration also to thrive. So all is very well if we have the technology, but if farmers can't afford really on the technology part, the question is um, what, what is the challenge here? So governments, last but not least, are as ever very, very essential actors in this, in this team play altogether. Perhaps more than ever, even all those challenges we speak about, global, systemic nature, we need to play the role, the government needs to play the role in terms of activation, in terms of accel acceleration, certainly supporting that, that innovation, innovation pace. One example here is, is the Green Deal, the most ambitious package of sustainability legislation which has ever been devised, including all the measures which is governing agriculture, and we, as a company and as an industry, we are by and large delighted by the Green Deal and its ambition. Our vision as a company is mirrored really in the ambitions of the Green Deal. We talk about health for all, hunger for none, and we are really tackling climate change and food security as, as a company. So the Green Deal shows that politi politicians, as ambitious as they need to be, if we want to achieve the intensification which is required, to boost food production while mitigating the climate change. So having, having said all that, what it boils really down to the fact that having the, the food value chain working together is the absolute key. A diverse set of competencies, a diverse set of capabilities, a diverse set of farmer connects, different angles really of, of, of farmer centricity, which is so important, which really means that it, it's all about farmers to food processors, retailers to regulators. And thank you very much for kicking off those proceedings. As I said, I'm really, really delighted that we have such esteemed panel of, of experts over here across the food value chain to discuss what we need to do even more, to discuss what we need to do to, even, to be even more impactful, to ensure that this complex system of food production develops at a speed which is required to meet the frightening challenges we all face. Now with this, Emiko, back to you. Thank you. Thank you, Jens. Um, very interesting. Um, before we start the discussion, uh, uh, Bears asked us to do a poll on um, agriculture sustainability. Um, I think it's on your screens now. Um, we as presenters can't see it, um, but uh, you can use the code has, hashtag FTBayer. And um, uh, what we'd like to do is to look at, compare the results for uh, the beginning of the, the poll at the, taken at the beginning, and then we'll take another poll at the end of the, the discussion and see if we've managed to move the needle in, in some sort of way, um, if, if, if the, the panel's actually made an impact. Anyway, um, with that, um, uh, that's that's going to be running in the background. So if you'd like to um, uh, respond to the panel, uh, the poll, please do so. Um, without further ado, I'd just like to um, met, talk about how this panel is quite different from the ones I normally um, moderate, just because there are various different people from um, uh, the, the value chain. And I think um, all of you pre this panel, we've talked about the need for collaboration and breaking down silos um, in order to push for sustainability. But um, John Crawford, I was just wondering, you had a very good analysis on why, you know, we are so siloed and, and how that is getting in the way of pushing, um, pushing sustainability forward. Thank you. Yeah. Um, and I'd like to thank Jens also for, for his opening remark where he mentioned the word that the food system is a complex system. And I didn't even have to prompt him to say that. <laughs> and from, from my background, which is in theoretical physics, um, 
that, that makes a profound difference. So the fact that the food system is probably one of the most fragmented sectors in on the planet, you know, we've got nearly half a billion farmers probably globally. Um, the, and then from the farm to the consumer, there are many players uh, in between. And what's happened is that the food system for various reasons has become very siloed. Um, and, and you do not optimize a system by optimizing the parts in isolation, which is what we've been doing because there isn't that connectivity. Um, and if we're going to address the, um, the challenges of meeting future demand for food whilst also solving the, the biodiversity and climate crisis, uh, we need a systemic change. Um, and a systemic change means reconnections. You don't change systems by, by, by changing the parts, you change systems by changing the way that the connections are made. And that's at every level. So connections between farmers, connections between farmers and the buyers, and all the way up the, the, the value chain. Um, the challenge is then for that whole value chain to try to co-create a solution um, and navigate uh, the, the, the challenges of doing that, which for some organizations will mean quite a different business model and evolving into that business model pretty quickly. Um, and Diana, um, when we talked about value chains, you you expressed um, some a lot of your members are quite frustrated, quite lost. Um, and you wanted to rebalance the farmer's position in the value chain. And, and um, you had a, th a few thoughts about that. Yes, thank you, Miko, and uh, it's a true pleasure to be here. Um, I wouldn't use the word frustrated. I think we're just trying to be a little bit realistic on the fact that the farmers in the value chain for a very long time have been kind of pushed to to the corner of the chain. But if we consider you know, the, the physics of a chain, a chain is made by many links, and if we have one that is made absolutely weak, the whole chain is going to definitely, in the end, uh, crumble. So if we want a system that is strong, resilient, that is capable of uh, really tackling the challenges that we have when it comes to climate change, when it comes to giving uh, sufficient food to, to a growing population, safe food, uh, but also where even the system that we're working in now and seeing how food is central even in geopolitical uh, peace, let's call it this way, uh, well, then we need, we need the farmers to be able to have a position of strength, to be able to, to survive. Uh, and what we see is instead uh, decreasing numbers, especially in the EU when it comes to the farming community. We have a very uh, scarce number of, of new farmers and we have farms that are closing all over Europe. And if we don't have farmers farming, then we will definitely not have food to go into the value chain. So my idea is that we really have to, in a way, strengthen the farmer's position, uh, creating partnerships where the farmers and the rest of the value chain uh, go into a relationship of, of trust where everyone is an equal partner and everyone understands the need for every single segment of the value chain uh, and works in a, in a systemic way in order to make sure that this, this value chain is overall uh, sustainable because uh, let's say that even there if if the, the rest of the value chain doesn't recognize the efforts that the farming system is going to have to go through to become more sustainable at uh, agronomic level through the the farm to fork and through the various regulations and directives that will come from the farm to fork well, if the value chain, the rest of the value chain, the suppliers, the buyers, and the consumers don't recognize this effort, and, and this effort doesn't go in the value chain giving a fair recognition uh, and remuneration to the farmers, then again, this, this, it's just, just not going to work. Um, Christine, so I guess you are, Hero is a, a consumer brand making consumer goods for for um, for retailers, um, I mean, where when we spoke, we did you, you you also stressed the need for collaboration. But how how what kind of dialogues are you having with the rest of the value chain, being you know given that you are downstream, and you know how do you connect with those sorts of people? 
Yeah, thanks, Emiko. Um, so really briefly for context, so Hero is a mid-sized food company and the products that we're selling are primarily baby foods, uh, marmalades and snacks. Why is that important? Because the cropping and our sourcing and our working with farmers is in those areas, fruits and vegetables and cereals, primarily in Europe and also in North Africa. So I fully, so to your question, Emiko, and then building on what John and Diana were highlighting is that I think it's a complex situation. And ultimately, if we come down to perhaps the, ne the less sort of sexy topics, less around innovation and you know, new, new ways of working and sort of focusing in on how we currently source and having a focus on sustainable sourcing, focusing more on planetary health diets, what, where we know we need to reformulate and build on our products is this concept of taking a step back and to Diana's point as well, looking at the current engagement model and current partner model between food companies, between off takers, traders, and directly with farmers. And so in that context, there are so many different initiatives that, uh, that can be taken from uh, upstream value chain companies. One, area of focus for us in particular is that we're looking at our existing sourcing guidelines and how we buy. And this, again, it's not so uh, utterly exciting, but it's the basics of how we engage with suppliers, traders, and farmers. And here we're in the midst of taking our, our existing procurement specifications for sustainability and broadening them for climate-friendly farming. And this, I think, is a very good first step in terms of this vision of having more of a harmonized and simplified buying and selling process. Because at the end of the day, farmers are businessmen and women selling a high value product. And so the, the linkage back to the value chain, intermediaries, traders, food companies with simplified, uh, aligned, harmonized uh, criteria in terms of what climate friendly farming factors look like and what we're willing to pay for, I think is a good first step. Oh, really interesting. I think two points with, with, which I'd like to kind of expand on, but before um, we go on to that, um, uh, can I just remind people that, you know, please send in your questions into the into the chat box anytime. Um, if, I, if something pops up and um, there's something interesting, I, I'll throw it at the, um, the audience. Um, going on to Jens, um, so collaboration, you know, system, systematic change, we all need to work together. How, how does that actually happen? How does that look for you? Um, and why isn't it happening as much um, as, you, as people want now, do you think? Um, good, good question, Emiko. And I, I might just to, um, connect the dots a little bit um, to, to your various points the panelists have mentioned. John, you talked about uh, creating co-creating solutions. You talked about new business models. Um, Diana, you mentioned um, the the strengthening of the farmers' position, creating partnerships, relation of trust, equal partner. What also I was talking about at the beginning, and then Christine, you you came to the point of 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 the entire engagement model, more harmonized processes, simplified criteria. I think at the end of the day, this all points very much to 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 this this end to end view. Um, I've been been um, talking about at the beginning from far, farm to, to fork really, and and the roles the roles different players have to play, and um, and and we, for example, from our point of view, invest massively in in various parts of of solving solving farmers' problems from from crop protection to seeds to trades, and and now putting a lot of focus on on the digital transformation of agriculture, because we we firmly be believe that digital is going to be one of the the absolute key enablers to exactly address what all of us talked about earlier, talked about new business model developments, a lot of efforts on on, on really different types of, of engagement models with, with value chain partners in, in agriculture, digital looking at how can we strengthen farm acquisition. Diana, you mentioned um, the reduction of, of farms in Europe, a very, very important point. On the other hand side, we see also the 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 farmer farmer type so to say changing the the younger generation much more eager for new technologies much more e eager to 
to really embrace a digital transformation in, in agriculture. And I think through that, as, as different players with, for example, the commitment I talked about, um, it's, it's going to be one of the key driving forces to, to address those challenges which were highlighted before. Um, so the, the technology um, is going to be important, but uh, Diana, I think when we spoke um, uh, earlier, you were, you were talking about this technology gap or technological skills gap, um, which you felt that needed to be um, filled. You know, a lot of young farmers are out there, but, but you know, they, and there's lots of digital technology out there as well, but someone needs to help them, right? Yes, I, I firmly believe that um, right now we're in a moment where we've had this huge technological advancement, and it's, it's incredible to see, uh, both in the instruments we can use in the field, when I think of precision farming, but also when we have all these instruments that can connect, uh, collect data from our fields and give us a better understanding of what is going on and what to do. But at the same time, I really believe that we're still a major step back when it comes to the capacity of farmers and even of young farmers of truly understanding that technology and using that technology at its full extent. And when we have something this powerful and we don't use it at its full extent, we're wasting. And when we waste, we're unsustainable. So if the fight here is to become more sustainable, we actually have to help farmers uh, breach that knowledge gap, find the way to really understand and have programs in schools, in, in agri-tech institutes, in universities, in the field, in farmers organizations to really make this type of, of knowledge more understandable, more uh, user-friendly and that way really finding a way even I think to show the farmers that even using this type of technology and uh, only for themselves is again another way of just being very limited. Uh, once we start putting all of this data together and we start sharing information and seeing how for example climate patterns work, how disease patterns work, uh, how soil could be even like stretched between different uh, different farms but have similarities, well, that is when I think we will really have that full empowerment that we need. Uh, but of course, we're, we're, <laughs> there's a lot of work to do there. We really need uh, member states and, you, and to build these programs, to, to believe that this is the way we move forward because otherwise the type of investment that farmers undertake to bring this type of technology inside of their farms is going to be very hard for them to, to turn over if they don't use it to their full extent. And again, if we, <laughs> I've decided that really, if I were to break down my idea of sustainability, it's, it's zero waste. You don't waste financial resources. You don't waste uh, knowledge. You don't waste technology. You need to be able to use everything to its full extent. Um, John, you're an academic, but oh, I'll cut, Christine, I'll, I'll come to you afterwards. Um, you're an academic, but um, uh, you know, you are also an agri-tech entrepreneur and you advise various governments on these sorts of things. I mean, how does, how do you fill that gap and, and how do you help farmers, young farmers, um, with a vast array of, of mind-boggling technologies that are out there? Well, as a a couple of points I'd like to make is that um, technology is, is a big part of this. At some point, I would like us also to think about the demand side, uh, because yeah. the, the solution here is not all on the production side, by far. Um, so it's not all on the farmers. Um, but what I will say is farmers are innovators. And we need to, well, my humble opinion <laughs> is that we need to give them agency in this. And an agency is, is the uh, ability to share those innovations and to help each other and and as a so you're right as a scientist I mean when I was starting out as a scientist uh, nothing horrified me or scared me more than talking to a farmer because they always knew a hell of a lot more than I did uh, and they still do um, but there is a huge disconnect between science I mean farmers I think trust science they don't trust too many other things um, but there's a huge disconnect between science. Now, technology, I, I talked earlier about reconnecting. Technology offers a great way of reconnecting science and farming. Um, on an equal 
on an equal level, right? Farmers are innovators, science are innovators. We can learn from each other. And and there isn't the same sort of vested interest and conflicts of interest that that, that apply. So I would like to, to reconnect uh, farmers with each other. And, and they've asked us for that um, in, in the discussions that we've had. They uh, create a peer learning network, if you like. But to support that learning by helping farmers access the best learning materials from a scientific perspective, what are the best science-based solutions, um, and, and also to collaborate with farmers to help them solve their own problems with technology. I think the, the issue, when something new comes along, everybody has, struggles to, to stay in the same mindset and think, well, how does this new thing make me play the same game better? Actually, what technology offers is the possibilities to change the game and, and it can be uncomfortable for a lot of people, but but it, it's it's fundamentally important, I think, to, to think of, of technology in that way. And for me, the game-changing thing that technology offers is being able to measure everything everywhere, from farm all the way through to cons consumption. Mm -hmm. uh, if you can measure it, you can manage it. Um, and you can manage it at that systemic level rather than the compartmentalized level where a whole bunch of unintended consequences come from. So I 100% I support Diana in, in what she's saying. We need to support farmers, but we also need to support them to give them agency. I believe agency comes in them having ownership of this kind of peer learning network uh, um, where they can learn from each other much faster and also challenge companies like Bayer and scientists like me to come up with better ideas that hmm. work better. Yeah. Um Christine, you had you had something. Yeah, just a small build. Uh, so indeed, to Diana's point in terms of the digital tools that, and also to John's point in terms of the, the measurement. So a, a practical example, a concrete example would be fully agree with Diana in the sense that, and, and Jens mentioned it as well, digital tools, you know, precision agriculture, farm management systems, we have very sophisticated on-farm digital tools in use. Um, more so in broadacre, a bit less so in food and, and uh, veg, but in general, very much so, especially in Europe. And one of the gaps that I've observed um, with our with with farmers we're working with, with suppliers, with traders, with intermediaries, and food companies is that there's a a bit to Diana's point as well earlier, where value chain, therefore the linkages are key. There's a bit of a dis disruption or a disconnect between a very high level of sophisticated on-farm data through farm uh, management systems and then what's brought up the chain. So for example, there are some early stage tools that we're using like the FSA, SA, SAI tool, cool farm tools that reflect greenhouse gas and climate patterns that Diana mentioned, but they're not yet extending up the value chain. And then so the hypothesis and what I'm observing and I'm seeing suppliers and traders and farmers asking for this is again, this harmonized focus on which are the key data elements that we want to measure, <clears throat> pardon me, measure and capture in the digital tools because current crop protocols and current crop books are massive in their data set. So really harmonizing and simplifying the life of a farmer to say we're focusing on nutrients, soil health, on-farm energy use, Deanna's point, food loss and waste. We hit the key levers that are driving greenhouse gas reduction and environmental benefit, and then take those data elements and start to extend them up the value chain, I think would be have huge impact. And and are you are there means of doing that at the moment? And are consumers actually in, in, interested, um, Christine? Yeah, exactly. So then to John's point in the terms of the demand side. So uh, in preparation for the panel as well, I had a quick look at most recent market data. So market data, so for example, coming, I'll have a quick look at the data because I made a note of it. So from, for example, Mintel, which is a large European-based market research company or Omnicom, not to be confused with Omnicron, uh, but Omnicron, Omnicom from the US and North American. So in general, these large market research, market insights institutes and academics are highlighting, yes, consumers and channel partners are very aware and are sensibilized, sensible is that's a word, sense, aware, fully aware. Of, sensitized. Sensitized of 
sustainable agri needs, the importance of sustainable agriculture for our current climate situation, geopolitical situation. What the findings are still uh, in Europe, let's just focus in on Europe and let's say North America, is that the how, which actions to take is still a, a struggle. So this ESG constellation, environmental drivers, societal drivers, the importance of sustainable agriculture, yes, front and center. And there's a willingness to pay, especially among our, our generation set, our youngest generation, up to, I think, Mintel highlighted 70%, they're looking for ESG products. But what that means and where their focus, if the focus is more on soil health, biodiversity, and on-farm energy, this is where some of the confusion comes in. So, Emiko, in answer to your question, it's still a bit of a mixed bag and responsibility for us as a food company is, of course, consumer awareness, knowledge sharing, being really transparent. But it's, again, the topic that John talked about, it's systemic. So it's, you know, across the whole food system, mm -hmm. all the food companies, academics and uh, public sector actors raising this awareness of what to focus on in that space for sustainable agriculture, where the biggest difference, where the biggest impact lies. Mm. No, that's very interesting. Um, Jens, I was just wondering if you could address those those points about technology and digitization. Um, you know, they the farmers need help. Um, John's point about the data, if you can manage it, you can, you know, you 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 know got it but it's how do you manage the data i mean uh, if you if you're a young firm farmer and you've got data coming out of years and you're throwing out how do you do that and then also christine's point about um uh harmonization i mean you know everyone's got their own thing going um i've also got a question um from the audience as a, um i guess this person's a farmer as a farmer given the minimal margins that we have how can we invest in this digitalization world Shall we keep leveraging um, us up uh, to the hilt? Um, so it's not easy. Digitization is great and technology is great, but um, you know, how, how do yeah. people pay for it? How do young farmers pay for it? Look, a um, couple of very, very important points, Emiko, you mentioned, um, and, and coming back to your comments, Diane, John, what you added on, and, and Christine, you, you kind of closed um, various aspects. Now, first of all, you talked about the agency model, John. No? Um, in, in other words, how do we address what, Diana, what you said, um, how do we address that that um, farmer piece in terms of taking them along, empower them and making them part of the journey? I think the whole the whole innovation model, so to say, is changing in the, in the digital space. Now, if you look at traditional innovation in all our industries probably so it has been very much in-house focused up to a certain point of view when you face your regulators you put it into a very lengthy registration process until you come to the marketing stage now in the in the digital arena it's it's very much about co-creation it's very much about early prototyping and and going out and co-creating with with the farmers with with um on the field and and really addressing the key challenges we have so that's that's one part where we, as a company, for example, play a very important role, which we are aware of and, and really drive from, from a transformational point of view, even, even in our company. And um, one, of, one of you made the comment of game changing. That's what we see ourselves and also that's what we see ourselves internally in terms, of our, in terms of our company positioning. Now, the second part, um, and, and Christine, you, you mentioned that with regard to, to data, I think there, also linking it back to what I said at the beginning on, on, on two partnerships, end to end view. I think we need to be, be just bolder as value chain partners and get into co-creation of digital capabilities. Because at the end of the day, only we, we only learn this whilst doing this. Nobody is in a position in this panel over here or, or, or in our day-to-day -day work to, to define the data models we require and to define the data sets we need and to find the commonalities along the value chain on data sets, data set, sets which should seem, seemingly uh, seamlessly um, um, flow through. Um, similar to traditional off-taking value chain models, I think um, us in this call and, and in general, we just need to, to be bolder in identifying early enough what farmer pain point are we addressing and, and how, do we, how do we really do that from a digital capability development point of view together. 
Um, the last point um, coming coming in from the chat on the on the farmer talking about affordability and and cost of of innovation. Um, John, you mentioned business model change, and and we we are asking ourselves exactly the same question at the moment. To what extent are risk sharing opportunities um, due to the fact that you have more data, due to the fact that you have you have um, much more insights what's happening during during the season on the farm. To what extent does our business model change? To what extent does um, value capture models in collaboration with farmers change, where we participate in addressing pain points on the on 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 the farm, on the field? Um, so, the length of my answer again is just I think a true testimony on the complexity on on of the challenges we have, and also the need of all of us having to to be seriously engaged together. Acknowledging that in the digital space, collaboration is different than what, what we are used in the past. Um, I'd like to pick up on a, on a topic that I think is, and it's also coming up on um, on, on the questions as well, um, is the um, uh, issue about soil. And I, and I think it affects um, everyone and um, including, but it's interesting because as, as a consumer, I don't think about soil and, and what's what's in my soil. And, and But, but it, um, I, I John, you're a soil expert, and and when we talked, you said it was it's the it's you know cure for everything, and and uh, this is where it all has to start. If you can just sort of talk about it a bit. Yeah, sure. So yeah, you're right. I'm I'm unhealthily obsessed with soil. Um, it it literally is Mother Earth, right? It's the source of natural fertility in the planet, and we have degraded that by about forty percent globally through unsustainable practices. Um, now, when you degrade soil, you degrade its capacity to hold water, to hold nutrients, uh, and it makes the whole thing, as Dana was saying earlier, a lot less efficient. Um, so, you, if you're going to fix the food system, you need to start from the soil. You don't finish there, but but you need to start with the soil. Um, and there are huge opportunities for efficiency gains if we start to put energy back into the soil. So the way that we have farmed, because of compartmentalized thinking and the science, we have compartmentalized the, 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 the field into plants and the, and the soil into physics and chemistry and biology, and we study these bits in isolation, but it's a system, right? Um, and, and what we're learning now is that it's a living system. Soil is incredibly diverse, um, uh, biologically diverse. It's physically complex. It's unlike any other material we know on the planet. It's all the time adapting and self-organizing and changing according to conditions. But its capacity to do that depends on energy, and that energy is carbon. Now, if there's one take home I'd like everybody to take away from this uh, meeting, it's there is no trade-off between feeding the planet and solving the climate and food security crisis. It's synergistic, right? So how do you get healthy soil? Do you get carbon in it? Now there's more carbon in soil than there is in all of the plants and the atmosphere combined. It's a huge climate regulator, um, but we haven't acknowledged that until very recently. Um, uh, all of a sudden, the, the financial sector has become interested in soil, I'm stunned. Um, but but absolutely delighted because investing in soil is probably the single most important thing that we can do. Now, it's not going to solve all the climate problems by far, but it will mean that that farmers in some of the most vulnerable uh, parts of the world will need to worry less about water uh, and floods and droughts, um, and their uh, agriculture will be more resilient to future climate if we fix the soil. So. Soil is a big part of the solution. It's not the whole solution by far, but it's an important part. But in order to fix the soil, you do need to move up the value chain to what, because the way that we demand and consume food um, puts much greater pressure on soil to produce than, than a healthier diet. Um, D Diana, your farmers and soil, I think you know a lot of the, the young farmers you were saying are very keen on, on um on that aspect and sustainability. Oh, it was absolutely the first step we put on uh, when I started my mandate in, in September. We, we draw, drew together uh, a seven-step road to sustainability in agriculture according to young farmers because we really wanted to have a very pragmatic approach 
And step one was the soil, because it, it is our most precious resource. We, we farm on soil and we need our soils to be healthy. We need, uh, but also there, we also need to start having a different approach. It's not just an, an input. It's something you also have to feed. It's something you need to make sure uh, that you keep healthy, that you keep, uh, you keep allowing it to give. Uh, so that was our, our first step and really helping farmers uh, understand uh, their soils is, is to us something like incredibly, it's, it's one of the strongest things we could do for the farmer. So we were actually very um, positive when, uh, when one of the proposals was uh, the, the testing for soils for free for farmers, because that's, again, you're giving, you're putting in the farmer's hands the knowledge that they need to work properly. Uh, but as we said, this all needs to kind of go along a road where the road is, is composed by, by many different aspects. But the final, your final destination is the consumer, is who are we producing? Who are we doing all of this effort for? And is the consumer going to be capable of understanding that effort? Is he also going to be able to remunerate? And when we were doing a, a study on how to rebalance the value chain, how to help farmers kind of advance in the value chain, uh, a study we came across gave us uh, a bit of a preoccupying kind of uh, piece of information, which was that the consumer is not willing to pay more for sustainability in general, but he would be willing to pay more if he knew that that larger share went to the farmer and for the farmer's practice. So mm -hmm. this is something I think we can work on and where I believe, again, using that data to its full extent so using all of that data that we collect to be something that then gets transformed into an information that the consumer can, can have and on which he can base his choices, I think is another very uh, powerful possibility that we have in our hands right now. Mm. That's really interesting. I mean, Christine, how, how do you tell the consumer and how, would, how do you think they would react? Um, will they pay more for it? And how... How do you then transfer that remuneration to the farmer? Or no, the, it's, or it's, equally it's, along the supply chain? Yeah, indeed, indeed. And so spot on, fully agree with the, the builds from uh, John and Diana. One, one area where we're starting to see success is with baby foods. <clears throat> and in baby foods in particular in North America and the US at this point, the concept, the academic concept of planetary health has landed really well from Lancet, from other academic institutions. So this concept of good for me, good for the planet. But then it comes back to Diana's point as well. There's still a bit of confusion in, with most consum consumers. What does that really mean? And I really like Diana's point of this third anchor point to say, uh, good for me, good for planet, good for soil, which brings it back to the farmer so that we start to articulate these linkage points um, and that I do think is, is, is something we can communicate. And we're seeing that with other food companies. We're seeing that with us in terms of, especially with our direct sourcing and those that are more linked to planetary health around fruits and veggies and pulses and cereals. And the other point, and it brings it back to Jens as well, is this data. So we still need to have a clear me measure of soil organic matter that we can communicate. So we have to be very credible with our claims on product. So we need to be able to justify and say, if we're taking actions, we're working more closely with our farmers, we're increasing soil organic matter. How do we communicate that back to the consumer credibly with data for greenhouse gas that's linked to the product claim? Mm, so no, really definitely really. it's the direction that we need to go, but it requires quite a bit of uh, yeah, uh, engagement. Um, Jens, um, I've also got a question on, on you know, improving the, the the sustainability of the value chain, but also um, the nutrition value of food. Um, how can investors who want to have a positive impact assess which companies are improving the availability of high nutritional value filled food, whilst allowing the um, negative environmental, whilst following the neg negative environmental impact of these practices? I guess you know companies which ultimately um, contribute to and farmers and academics maybe um, contribute to healthy nutritional food. I mean, how do you evaluate them? 
uh, as a company, how do investors, um, you know, sort of uh, reward them? Um, I think that's, uh, Emiko, a very, very good question, um, which was posed in the chat. And just to to probably take take half a step back and, and looking at the entire value chain industry, so to say, over decades, you see a massive transformation change happening there in terms of in terms of what is your innovation model like, in terms of what are your customer interactions like with the farmers, in terms of what are your sustainability focus. And that, of course, that whole transformation change to a certain extent is also is also driven by what do investors require from companies being involved in the value chain and what do they require in terms of what the what the R&D commitments and the R&D focus areas and the business model changes are, are all about. So I, I would say, it's very much linked to to um, to to the, the self agenda of, of companies um, committing themselves to 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 that, that business model and and general transformation. John, you mentioned right at the beginning, and and through that and through the credibility and strong focus on on sustainability, continuous engagement with value chain partners, continuous engagement in the in the in the in the public space. You then grow investor confidence and get that respective return. Then no. So it's it's again a, a, a long haul activity um, to to be in with 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 a strong commitment to a mission which drives at the end of the day exactly those challenges we talked and John you 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 mentioned rightfully so we can't we can't look at feeding the planet and and climate change um, challenges in isolation that all all comes together and needs to be looked at um, together as as one. Yeah. Um... Yeah, that's that's absolutely right. Um, I think um, uh, our time is is coming to a close. Um, I just want to uh, put the poll up again um, and see if we if um, our audience wants to um, respond to that um, and join the discussion. Um, so, D Diana, do you have any sort of Last thoughts, um, maybe comments to other other panelists. Um, since we're all gathered here from various parts of the the value chain, oh, is she frozen? Um, <laughs> John. Um. Oh God, I've got the closing remarks. <laughs> no, no, you don't have the closing remarks. You just uh, just give us a short comment. I think Jens has uh, got the final closing comment. remarks. So before uh, we go to uh, that. I think the, um, the 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 key point is that that there are synergies, right? Absolutely, Eat, if, if people might not want to pay for sustainability, but they do want to pay for health. They do want to be healthy, um, and and you know the baby food market I think it, it exemplifies that. People want healthy food. Um, healthy food is healthy diets. Actually, it's not a single food item. It's a combination of things. Um, a more varied diet largely plant-based, great for soil, great for the climate. Um, it's a win-win, um, but it does need the whole system to move in a coordinated way. So the demand creates the change in the supply and vice versa. Um, oh, Diana's back. Um, Diana, do you have any final thoughts, comments for other panelists? No. Um, Christine? Yeah, thank you. And then we can head back to Diana. So, sorry, the I, guess I today... spoke to myself. Um, that uh -huh. this collaboration is what we really need. Oh, why so, don't we uh, get Christine? Why do, Christine, I'll why don't you really go ahead brief, and then we'll... Diana? And then back to you. So, the conversation today, I think, was spot on. It was really open and honest, and there it, the, we highlighted the complexity. What the key point that I would like to leave everyone with is step change. So but new data, digitization opportunities, new business models, absolutely, we need to move in this direction. But this, from a food company point of view with our suppliers and working directly with farmers, uh, a first priority for us is rethinking our current engagement models. So how, what are the specifications? What are the sustainable sourcing criteria? How to simplify? and rethink and optimize and harmonize that engagement with farmers and suppliers. So again, just emphasizing the step change. It's a huge complex problem, but taking action and targeting short-term wins is really important. 
Deanna? Let's see if this works. Uh, it's the beauty of connecting from a farm. You never know <laughs> how long you will have actually connection for. Um, no, that this was conversation was, uh, it was something I really treasure because what I, I'm starting to see is this collaborative approach. The idea that we really need to put everyone's needs, but also everyone's aspirations together. And that this is what is going to drive change if we want, if we want change. And we all agree that we want change. We want to help our planet. We want to keep farming. We want to keep giving the world safe, sufficient, wonderful food. Um, because there is so much around food that I won't even start to, to, to say what I, what I truly believe. But um, the, And seeing how taking so many different actors, but still the, the, the common philosophy is there was something that is very empowering and that we need to work on and feed on. Great. Well, before we go to Jens for the closing remarks, um, let me just, just read out um, uh, the closing poll results are coming in, but they don't seem that different from, from the opening one. So let me just read. 26% um, of you said um, disruptive innovation in farming and across the agri-food value chain was important. 43% said better collaboration across the agri-food value chain. So I think that tops. 7% said more support to all actors of the agri-food value chain. And 24% said regulatory environments that enable rather than hinder A, B, and C. Um, so uh, thank you for, for responding to that. And um, Jens, you've got the closing remarks. Over to you. Yeah, thank, thank, thank you, Amiko. And a big thank you to, to all, of, all of the panelists today for that really engaging conversation. I'm looking forward to pick it up uh, in, in, in individual follow-up discussions to really see how we, how we can, can, can take that forward. And uh, Emiko, I think the, the poll said it all. Together, disruptive innovation and collaboration is 70% of, of the answers. And that has been the thread throughout, throughout the discussion we had for the last, um, for the last uh, 50, 50 minutes with a very strong focus on, on digital being, being the driving force a very strong push towards uh, full empowerment of, of our farmers um, to, to put them into that required position of strength. Um, we talked about that, that um, interlinkage, that absolute fundamental need of interlinkage between um, climate change, food security, and, and, and sustainability. And technology here is really changing the game. It's, it's, it's as you see in, in my background, if I would have been on my lap on my computer, we are seeing ourselves as well as a game changer in agriculture and as a company going going forward with a massive, massive focus on, on those points we, we talked about. So big thank you to um to the panelists, Amiko, a big thank you for for you orchestrating the discussion and back to you then. Great. Well, um, thank you, everyone. Um, thank you, all the panelists. Thank you for the members of the audience. I'm really sorry we ran out of time. Uh, we could have had another day, you know, talking about this and answering your questions. Um, but um, maybe um, you can join us again in November when we'll not have another um, dialogue on transforming the agricultural value chain. Um, thank you very much, Bea, for, um, for sponsoring the, the talk and um, see you in November. <laughs>